In fact, these pithy aphorisms were riddles waiting to be decoded. But this wasn't just a word game. Those who successfully deciphered the code would be rewarded with immortality. And it was exactly the secrecy of the sayings and what they promised that the orthodox leaders of the church found so disquieting. I wanted to know about the promise of eternal life held in these enigmatic teachings and about the people who believed in them. So I joined Bart Ehrman for a glimpse of the forgotten world in which Thomas once flourished. This gospel emphasizes the importance of secret knowledge for salvation. The key to salvation, according to the Gospel of Thomas, is by learning the secret teachings of Jesus and knowing what they meant. There were groups of Christians in, er in the early church known as Gnostic Christians. They were called Gnostics because the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. They were the Christians who knew, who had the secret knowledge that brings about salvation. In my opinion, the Gospel of Thomas is a Gnostic Gospel propounding a set of beliefs that if, if people can understand, they'll have eternal life. Religion has been you know, full of secret teachings. Why did the early church leaders find that so disturbing? Because the way of salvation that's taught in this gospel stood at odds with the way of salvation taught by the tradition, what became traditional Christianity. According to these church fathers, salvation was open to everybody, high and low, intelligent, unintelligent, rich and poor, anybody who believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus. But according to these texts, it's only people in the know, only the inside group, those who had esoteric knowledge who could have salvation. This is a very different understanding of salvation that could cut at the very root of what early Christianity was all about. Today, Christians universally accept that it's Jesus' resurrection and not just the interpretation of his teachings that leads to eternal life. But the Gospel of Thomas reveals that in the third and fourth centuries, it wasn't so clear cut. I can see how a gospel that promised salvation through Jesus' teachings alone could well be very, very popular. In the rational world of the 21st century, a text which plays down the more unbelievable elements of his life, his miracles, his being raised from the dead, could be very attractive. But the world of the early Christians was very, very different. And there was one reason, in particular, why early Orthodox Christian leaders wanted to believe that it was Jesus' victory over death that was the only path to salvation. In the third and fourth centuries, Christians throughout the Roman world, even those here in Egypt, suffered persecution. Their refusal to worship other gods and their persistence in flaunting their own beliefs created tensions and suspicions, and thousands were killed for their faith. And for these Christians living in fear, there was one aspect of Jesus' life that in particular sustained them, and it was his suffering on the cross, but more importantly, the knowledge that on the other side of that suffering lay redemption, the resurrection. Jesus was a role model. If he had suffered and been resurrected, then their own suffering had a purpose. A gospel which placed no importance on Jesus' death and physical resurrection, like Thomas, was never going to provide reassurance to those facing martyrdom. And it's no surprise that Gnostic Christians were well known for not being prepared to die for their faith. It's for this reason that for many groups of Christians, the Gospel of Thomas 
is so subversive. A Jesus who was a teacher of wise words is all very well and good, but it's not worth risking your life for. And unless Christians were willing to stand up for, and in some cases to die for, their faith, the Christian religion might well face a very uncertain future. The Gospel of Thomas reveals that during the first centuries of Christian history, there were no fixed right ideas. In fact, the infighting was intense and the battle lines blurred. This is the story of a war, but not one fought with swords and spears. It's a battle of words. The history of early Christianity was a bloody one, and the stakes were high. All sides believed they were the holders of the truth and that the texts and the ideas they contained were the way to salvation. These books held the key to the future of your soul. They could make the difference between eternal paradise and perpetual damnation. In the Roman Catholic Church today, the result of one such battle is only too apparent. Here at the Church of Santa Maria Magdalena, in the heart of Rome, administering Mass is very much a male affair. In fact, throughout the Roman Church, the corridors of power are full of men. Women have a role, but it's as a mother, virgin wife. The church has argued that it's a model which extends right back to the time of Jesus himself. The four gospels all record that he chose 12 disciples and that they were all men. It follows, they argue, that the priestly office should be held only by men in imitation of Jesus' decision 2,000 years ago. But among the many remarkable discoveries of Nagamadi were Gospels, which painted women in a very different light to the way they came to be portrayed within the canonical Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, women are barely mentioned. And certainly Jesus didn't have any female disciples, but in the suppressed Gospels of Philip and Mary and in the Acts of Tecla and Paul, the picture is very different. Far from being minor characters, these Gospels reveal a church where in the first centuries after Jesus' death, women took center stage. And even more surprising, they suggest that in the years of Jesus' life, women were even involved at the heart of his mission. And one of these texts suggests that there was one woman in particular who played a very important role in Jesus' ministry. She's someone who's more usually associated with prostitution and madness than teaching the word of God. She's the bad girl of Christianity, Mary Magdalene. For centuries, in art and literature, Mary Magdalene has been depicted as the repentant sinner, the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. But with the new discoveries of Nagamadi, a radically different and far more controversial picture of Mary is emerging. In these texts, Mary appears very frequently as one of Jesus' prominent disciples. And in one of the Nagamadi documents, in a text attributed to another of Jesus' apostles, there's an even more striking revelation. 